Good morning, everybody. I've had a lot of coffee and I'm getting kind of hungry too, so I won't stand too long in your way. I thought I'd uh, do two things. Um, this is the first time in 20 years uh, I've actually done a marine geography class. I've done coastal many times, coastal GIS, spatial analysis of coastal environments, coastal and marine resources. But over the years, uh, I watched, especially like Dawn, uh, kind of leading the charge on marine side. So I thought it was time in my recent move back to Old Dominion to sort of stand that up. We have a, a standout uh, oceanography program, a large number of geographers and GIS students. So here's the wild ride that I've been on the last uh, couple of months uh, trying to step this up. Uh, I thought a story map would be appropriate, so I'll, I'll distribute this in some way, maybe on the GeoNet uh, through the community. Uh, look forward to any input you have. Um, there, marine geography has a, a long history uh, in geography. It, it also shares lineage with oceanography through people like uh, Matthew Fontaine Maury, um, uh, Athelstan Spillhaus, and many others. So we do have this kind of common uh, heritage, if you will. Um, I, I put a flyer together that seemed to attract quite a few students last spring. And so the course made, and here we are. I've uh, got 20 students in this class. So it's a face-to-face -face course at ODU. Um, it actually uh, does have prerequisites. So you have to have some GIS functional knowledge and some either oceanography or environmental geography background. Uh, it's about half geographers in the class, uh, undergraduates mostly, and about half uh, oceanography graduate students and marine biology graduate students. So a great fun combination. Um, the format is one hour uh, or, or three credit hours once a week. Uh, we get together uh, Wednesday night. I heard the lab was cranking last night. This also piggybacks onto a certificate that we developed at ODU back around 2000 with uh, George Ortel, uh, a prominent uh, geological oceanographer, because of the Spatial Analysis of Coastal Environments Certificate. We have at least two of those graduates in the audience, so big shout to Keith uh, Van Graflin, I know many of you uh, know him, and George McLeod, who's also uh, my right-hand guy um, and fellow surfer there at, at ODU and Center for Geospatial uh, visualization. Uh, this certificate has, uh, you know, had about 150 students over those years um, and uh, it has core background courses in GIS, remote sensing, coastal, and marine topics. So when I put the course together, this is basically the modules. I've kind of pawned some uh, nautical terms here. The first is my own background is a little more geological and geomorphological. So we, we're going out to scraping all kinds of data together. Uh, there's the world seafloor geomorphology. Uh, we're getting all kinds of bathymetric data and not down to the level of hydro, teaching hydrographic surveying techniques, but um, at least manipulating those data using them for in more broader scale ge geographic context. So there's some of the things we use. Um, students are actually going out and manipulating, uh, importing data, analyzing it with single beam, multi-beam, multi and uh, so on. Uh, how to produce, you know, the cartography, doing some nautical chart. Uh, that's Norfolk Canyon off the Virginia coast. Uh, bringing that in 3D, um, getting in the move to Arc Pro, ArcGIS Pro. Uh, there's actually a, a sort of segue I have in an exercise where we look at tsunami genic uh, slopes around the world and uh, factors there. That's a, one I kind of didn't know much about in my own backyard at the Currituck submarine mass failure. It's 185 cubic kilometers. Um, so if we get the real big wave one day, that'll be uh, something to write home about. Um, you know, we have about a half a dozen lab exercises for right now that I've developed, one for each of these modules. So we spend a lot of time surfing the uh, World Ocean Atlas and um, students download the data. We actually take that a little step beyond, and we've been looking at data from CLIM systems, uh, SimClim or Arc Marine data there. So projecting some of these variables out into the future, like pH, salinity, oxygen, uh, sea surface temperature, and so on. And that's been an amazing uh, eye-opener for some, some of us. Um, there's pH in the Northwest Atlantic uh, 2050. Uh, EMUs is awesome excitement uh, when we got the Explorer launched uh, I drove into that and brought that up into class. It's there in the background of the story map. And students have now been um, roaming through that, We've imported it, trying to localize it. Um, so I'm, I'm really 
optimistic about doing that. I like the Chesapeake Bay uh, examples earlier today. And we actually read uh, an article that some of you have uh, written. Um, doing stuff on coral reefs. There's the awesome movie Chasing Coral. So I piggybacked on that a little bit and um, had had a long exercise mapping coral reefs and habitats in uh, the Virgin Islands with uh, Ortel and others. So we basically walked through the process of doing the geomorphic and uh, other habitat type of interp interpretation. One of my students just finished um, mapping coral reef uh, habitat types in New Caledonia, um, all from scratch. Looking at living resources, um, kind of picking uh, kind of pet topics. This is uh, an area I've kind of had some personal interest, looking at fish passages. So this is a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay, and we basically have modeled a sort of site suitability or uh, rather impediments to fish passage uh, suitability model. So it's actually uh, something you might work up in Model Builder, has a lot of the terrain analysis, hydrologic analysis functions, but it brings in infrastructure. It looks for culverts, looks for channel uh, pediments to uh, fish passage. Um, maritime wise, uh, I worked a lot at East Carolina University for a while with folks in maritime studies and I have a lot of the nautical uh, Navy kind of interest around Norfolk, Virginia. So we, we've actually start in a week looking at AIS vessel data and looking at uh, traffic and density con conflicts is where that's going to be uh, kind of heading. Uh, we're we're going to look at space time cubes, I think, for this as well uh, to look at how uh, different uh, vessels use uh, space differently in, uh, through time and maybe how that will intersect with uh, issues in terms of nautical chart quality and um, interactions like marine uh, mammals. Um, further, uh, the Arctic has uh, definitely been uh, on my attention. So we've been looking at um, getting some data from Canada, certainly NCEI, and um, looking at future territorial disputes and claims and resources. So that's um, something we're looking at. Um, toward the end of the class, I have a PhD student in the class who's doing work on uh, the, the provenance of uh, Arctic um, rafted sediments. So definitely going to sort that out. And then finally, the bitter end, which is a nautical term uh, for where you tie off, like on the cleats of a boat. Um, we're looking at sort of how we could tie this together. So the, the talk earlier on um, the wave energy site suitability, that's exactly the kind of thing I would like the students to come out with a broad view of marine GIS and geography and, uh, you know, Specialize, yes, but to, as geographers, we need to bring all these things sort of together. There's a couple of tools, and I think we're ready for lunch. Look forward to it. <laughs>